I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast and also Novus Ordo Watch on YouTube. And I'm joined by, well, Mario Dirksen himself from Novus Ordo Watch. As always, it's it's a great honor and pleasure to, to have a chat with Mario. And, and as, well, he's really the best in the business talking about what is going on right now in the Novus Ordo world. And lately, it's been a lot. I mean, I, I, I haven't been paying attention to all of it, to be to be for quite sure. frank. Mario does because that's kind of what he has to do. He does the dirty work for us. Mario, thank you. And so he's going to kind of <laughs> fill us in a, a little bit of what's going on and, and try to help clear things up, you know, from, from some of what's in the news based on, well, based on church teaching. Now, it kind of all started, uh, the, the, this news cycle, I suppose, started with Father James Altman. We're going to say Father. We're going to say Bishop. We're going to use their titles as people know them mm -hmm. by. We don't necessarily or don't consider them to be valid, validly mm -hmm. ordained or consecrated. It's not personal. Right. It's not something we're, we're not trying to you know take a dig at them. It's just obviously our position. But we're going to use their titles as given to them um, by the general right. populace. And it really has. Thank you. And it really has nothing to do with the issues that we're going to discuss now. Like, you know, whether they're validly ordained or not has nothing to do with it. But just for the record, we do not believe they're validly ordained. There's theological reason for that, but uh, not very relevant right now. Exactly. And so and so this started, Mario, with <clears throat> Father James Altman. And I think he he came out recently saying pretty much that Bergoglio is not the pope and cannot be the pope. Um, and that triggered, as we would expect, uh, you know, a whole volcano of, of, of you know, reactions from the, the, the Novus Ordo world and, of course, the Recognize and Resist world. Yes. And one of those reactions was from Bishop Athanasius Schneider, who is considered by many to be, what the is he? The standard of orthodoxy. Ex exactly. So if he, if he says it, well, then it must be true. It must be what we have to follow. And so we want to talk about what he wrote in, I think it's in 1 Peter 5, I believe, and we're going to kind of go point by point through that. Yeah, it's been, it was first released by Michael Matt at the Remnant. Apparently okay. this was an email that uh, Michael Matt received from Athanasius Schneider, and it has since been published on 1 Peter 5 and also on, on Schneider's own personal website. Uh, maybe we should just uh, for the sake of being uh, just for the sake of providing some background information, we should maybe make clear who uh, Bishop Schneider is and who he is not. Some people call him Archbishop. He is not an Archbishop. He is, in fact, not even the Bishop of a diocese. He's not an ordinary. He is only an auxiliary bishop. OK, and I don't say that to diminish him. I just say it because it's true. Uh, this is a description of the facts. And it is very important because so many people, you know, um, uh, think that, or they act as if Schneider had some kind of, you know, jurisdiction over the whole church where he can just, you know, issue papal corrections and and just kind of uh, lay down uh, or lay out the facts and the true doctrine for the entire church when in actual fact he doesn't even have a flock. He doesn't have his own flock at, un unless maybe... Um, the ordinary in the in his diocese, which is the diocese of Maria Santissima in Astana, Kazakhstan, in Central Asia, maybe the ordinary. I don't know how really how that works, but it's possible that he has maybe some kind of jurisdiction that was given him by his um, by his uh, ordinary. But generally speaking, uh, an auxiliary is just a, a helper bishop, like a sacramental bishop for confirmations and some other things. Uh, in a diocese, and that is all Athanasius Schneider is. Again, not to to slam him, it, just as a description of the facts. It's it's good to keep that in mind because uh, these things matter. Um, and we see actually a significant difference there between Schneider and Bishop Joseph Strickland of the Diocese of Tyler in Texas. And uh, this just uh, broke, I can't even remember when that was, about a week ago or so, depending on when People are watching this. That um, there was a leak from the from the Vatican, according to which uh, Francis is reportedly preparing to ask um, Sh not Schneider um, Strickland to resign his uh, office as uh, the ordinary of Tyler. And the interesting thing is that Schneider in Kazakhstan, has said a lot worse things and, and things that are more, uh, you know, in opposition to Francis's agenda than, than Strickland ever did. 
And uh, so the interesting thing, though, is that Schneider is going after, excuse me, Francis is going after Strickland and not Schneider. And uh, I don't know the explanation for that, but one uh, possible explanation is that Strickland is the ordinary. He's in charge of a diocese. Schneider is not. And um, now that's, uh, I don't have any other information on that. I am, unless, you know, um, Schneider is maybe, I w he's actually, Schneider's actually way more influential than Strickland. Right. Online at so, least, or, or you mean kind of in the, in the in, 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 interweb. In, uh, exactly. On the internet, on a global scale, uh, Schneider is the one that's been rattling the cage in 2016. So that was now seven years ago. He, he um, I think it was at a conference in Rome. So not far from Francis, he accused Francis of promoting with his Amoris Laetitia document, the exhortation, which means the joy of love. Schneider accused him of promoting the joy of adultery. Okay. Now that's, that's rhetorically, that's pretty strong. I mean, he's exactly right, uh, of course, but uh, Francis has never moved against Schneider, whereas he now, he already, um, uh, Strickland got an apostolic visitation. So it's not just rumor, there is opposition to Strickland and also the Vatican Nuncio has already warned Strickland uh, and so on. So it is odd that uh, Francis is uh, so concerned about Strickland, but uh, does not appear to be concerned about Schneider. In any case, having said that, um, let's just uh, go into that document. Can you pull, uh, pull it up on the screen, Kevin? Sure. Let me see. As everyone knows, be patient with me, bear with me with my technical <laughs> skills. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're showing the one, what is this, 1 Peter 5? Correct. Maybe maybe scroll up real quick and just we'll show people a picture of Athanasius Schneider. They've probably seen him uh, before, and so uh, so here he is and uh, issuing a statement on the validity of the pontificate of Francis. And I'd like to go through that uh, paragraph by paragraph or sentence by sentence, whichever the case may be. And just as a preliminary observation, I, th I, I want to say this. Um, it is very easy for those recognize and resist traditionalists to say that Francis is the Pope because they refuse him submission. Okay. Um, it, it would be, they would not be so quick in giving Francis the benefit of the doubt and all that. And who are we to judge the Pope and all that? if they believed they actually had to submit to his magisterium, okay? Yep. If they did not get um, to sift it and to ask others and to, you know, uh, whatever, tune in to Taylor Marshall or, you know, read what Peter Kwasniewski has written on the topic. Like, if they actually believed they had to accept it straight, I do not think many of them would be so sure that Francis really is the Pope. But um, we'll get... We'll get... Uh, into all that. So let's begin here with the first paragraph or first few sentences. Um, Bishop Schneider says this, there is no authority to declare or consider an elected and generally accepted Pope as an invalid Pope. The constant practice of the church makes it evident that even in the case of an invalid election, this invalid election will be de facto healed through the general acceptance of the new elected by the overwhelming majority of the cardinals and bishops. Uh, and uh, that was the entire first paragraph. So let me just say a few things about that. First, notice that Schneider is from the get-go is making this a matter of authority. He is not simply considering this uh, as a discernment of what is factually true but he approaches it in terms of authority. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that, that, he, that he can't do that. I'm just, for right now, I'm just describing what he's doing. Uh, also notice that he says there is no authority to declare or consider, okay? 
Now, declare is typically understood in a legal sense, whereas consider would just be, you know, a factual sense, right? Um, so he's sa he's lumping the two together into one and the same category, even though they're really they really don't belong together. It is one thing to uh, consider Francis a non-pope. It is another thing to make a legal declaration that he's not the pope that would, you know, bind the whole church, for example. Right. So I just noticed that he's lumping both of them together uh, as if they were equal when they're really not. Next, I'd like to uh, ask, because he mentions here that, well, he, Francis is a generally accepted pope, um, just who is accepting Francis as Pope? He says generally accepted. Okay, but by whom? Okay, and um, of course, if you're if you're Novus Ordo, then you'll say, well, the whole church accepts him. Okay, but Schneider can only make that argument to to people who already believe that the Novus Ordo Church that all those people are actual Catholics, um, and. While we're not trying to judge, you know, individual souls here, um, as far as you know what each person understands and 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 is or is not guilty of, um, it is becoming increasingly difficult uh, to consider Novus Ordo people simply as Catholics because they simply do not believe what Catholics believed until the 1960s. And so let's just uh, maybe put a little asterisk there and understand that that this argument about the general acceptance of Francis, well, it, it um, necessitates that all those people that are accepting him are uh, considered Catholics, and that's very disputable, okay? And in fact, these are usually the people that the recognizing resistors, the, the semi-traditionals, as li I like to call them, themselves don't really accept as Catholics, not in intention. They may very well be Catholics in intention, but in actual fact, because they're part of this new religion, right? If you go to the remnant, for example, you read their stuff, you find out they're constantly denouncing the new religion, right? The Vatican II religion, and, and rightly so, because it is a new religion. But all of a sudden, the members of that new religion are now supposed to uh, essentially uh, bear an infallible witness to Francis's legitimacy. It's simply grotesque. Okay, so that it's, it, it just that argument is not very strong. Besides, uh, there are plenty of people who accept Francis as Pope, who have nothing to do with him and and are not are not even trying to be Catholics. Okay, we just found out. Um, I think it was on Monday. You know, Francis spoke at the Clinton Global Initiative at some, some globalist conference with the Clintons. Well, the Clintons certainly accept Francis as Pope. Um, so what? Right. Right. And so just the, the very fact that people accept Francis as Pope um, means nothing unless it is actual Catholics. And uh, whether actual Catholics accept Francis as Pope, that's a whole different question. And of course, the answer is no. Um, so then he, uh, going back to what Athanasius Schneider wrote. So he says, there is no authority to declare or consider an elected and generally accepted Pope as an invalid Pope. And yet my question to him would be, well, what about the authority to declare or consider a generally accepted papal document being contrary to the faith, being non-binding, being harmful? Um, promoting the joy of adultery, for example. Why is it that the question of authority always comes up only with regard to whether Francis is a valid pope, and it never comes up with regard to correcting him, rejecting his magisterium, and so on? Why is it that the people who say, who am I to judge the pope, um, or who am I to determine who is the Pope? Why is it that they, it never occurs to them to say, well, who am I to reject the new mass? Who am I to criticize uh, the teaching of the Holy Father in one of his official documents? And the last point I want to make on this paragraph is that the bottom line is this. If Francis is the Pope, if we must consider him Pope, valid Pope, as Schneider argues, 
then it follows that whatever the Catholic Church affirms of the papacy must be true also of Francis, if he's the Pope. Let's keep that in mind, because that is what will ultimately refute the recognize and resist position and will prove definitively that Francis is not, in fact, the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Christ. So let's go to the uh, next paragraph. I'll quote it again, and then I'll make some comments. Uh, did you did you have anything to add uh, at this point, Kevin? Uh, I, I did, and then you said exactly what I was thinking, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, here's uh, Bishop Schneider. Even in the case of a heretical pope, he will not lose his office automatically, and there is no body within the church to declare him deposed because of heresy. Such actions would come close to a kind of heresy, a kind of a heresy of conciliarism or episcopalism. So on that, I'd like to say the following. First of all, it is merely Schneider's opinion that a heretical pope remains pope. However, let's just, for the sake of argument, let's just humor him and say, okay, he remains pope. What also remains then, though, is the obligation of the faithful to submit to him. You cannot separate those two things, okay? So if he remains pope, then he must be submitted to. You, you cannot uh, say, well, he's pope, but now I get to resist all the heresies he teaches. Well, well, no, it's the one or the other. Either uh, he is pope and you must submit to him, or he teaches heresy and you cannot submit to him and he cannot be the pope. And, and do, you, do you think, Mario, I mean, I, I wonder this often with the recognize and resist. Do you think it is a legitimate lack of understanding of the papacy and, and thus the hierarchy of the church? Or is it cognitive dissonance where they just kind of purposely are like, no, 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 can't be, that can't be. And so they kind of purposely don't understand. I, and again, this is generalizing, of course. Yeah. I, I think I think in, that's going to depend, you know, on each individual. Sure. I think there's a lot of confusion on the issues, uh, understandably. I mean, it's, you know, it's difficult, especially if, you know, if you're raising large families and, and so on. And, you know, not everybody has the same tools, the same level of understanding, or the same amount of time, uh, you know. So, it, um, but... I think we have to distinguish between like the, the pundits that are out there in public right. and have an obligation to understand what they're talking about. Uh, and this, the, the average person in the pew who really just wants to be a Catholic and is trying to do the best he can with, you know, the limited tools available. Um, but in my experience, they, m most of the people simply are not aware of the, the pre Vatican II Catholic teaching on the papacy. Right. And uh, really, the, the best uh, antidote to the, all of this confusion and all of these controversies is just read the pre-Vatican II theology books. Read the papal encyclicals, especially uh, of the early 20th and uh, uh, late 19th century, uh, or even just the whole 19th. In, in general, read any papal encyclicals. I mean, they didn't start till 1740. 1740 was the first encyclical. But... Yeah, just read the Catholic Magisterium, and you will quickly understand that it, it's impossible for Francis or any of the other Novus Ordo popes to have been true popes. It's simply impossible, because you would have to conclude that the pre-Vatican II Catholic teaching about the papacy is false. And unfortunately, that is what some are concluding now. Uh, God forbid, but, uh, you know, it's it, logic is like that you it, it you cannot uh affirm contradictory things so sooner or later the one or the other has to give way but um you know i, I don't want to get into all that now uh but it, yeah so in my experience a lot of times uh people are simply not aware of the catholic teaching and so the remedy is to educate yourself in that do not um you know go by just for the, in order to, um, in order to ensure that you're getting uh, the real deal, you're getting uh, the, the authentic teaching from the horse's mouth without any sort of bias or or anything. Just get the actual pre-Vatican II books, 
um, because nobody will be able to uh, argue that a book from whatever 1935 is somehow uh, skewed in favor of state of accountism, right? Or recognize and resist. It's simply not going to be. So that is, uh, in my opinion, the best way to go about uh, doing that. Now, going back to the uh, what Schneider said regarding the, oh, you know, the heretical pope does not lose his office automatically. Um, the question of a heretical pope, if it's possible to, to for a pope to become a heretic, um, and if so, what would happen? That question was considered by theologians, but it was never considered of a pope acting in his official magisterium, in his official capacity as pope, as teacher of the universal church because such a scenario is inherently absurd and impossible. What they did consider and discuss is the possibility of a Pope in his capacity as a private individual, okay? Never uh, would they have, uh, would, never did the theologians discuss the idea of a Pope teaching heresy uh, to the whole church in his capacity as, uh, as Pope. That, that that was never discussed. So right from the get-go, um, to even bring this up is actually um, misleading, okay? The heretical pope, we're talking about the privately heretical pope. Mm -hmm. uh, a pope who would, you know, uh, whatever, you know, over dinner, deny a dogma, right? And um, the question that if, if that, if he were to do that, or if that be, if they were, that were to become pop, public knowledge, so that everybody knows the Pope is privately not even a Catholic, you know, in his person, what would happen then? Would would that mean he loses the pontificate? They would have never considered it possible that this Pope would teach his heresy in his official documents to the to the entire Church, and and that's easy to understand why it, it would create an absurd situation, and um, it is, and this is really the key: it is impossible for a pope to be a heretic in his magisterium because it is impossible to reconcile that with what the church teaches about the papacy. So that is how we know. It has nothing to do with an opinion of this or that theologian. We know it's impossible for a pope to be a heretic in his magisterium because such a scenario is impossible to reconcile with the Catholic teaching on the papacy. And I want to give a concrete example of that. Kevin, could you put up um, the encyclical Qui Pluribus of Pope Pius IX? If you could pull that up on the screen. Did I lose you? No, it's up. I'm sorry. No, there it is. Wonderful. <laughs> I'm, I'm so okay. fast you didn't even see it. 1846. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's see. Can you scroll to uh, paragraphs number 10 and 11? Because I'd like to quote from there. Maybe you can highlight what, I, what I'm going to be reading. Uh, good. Perfect. Uh, I'm not going to quote all of it, uh, just a part of it. Uh, let me see. Where do I have it on my screen? Oh, there it is. Okay. Maybe not. Wait a minute. People who are listening and not watching us, they may be wondering why there's so much silence, but it's just because <laughs> I haven't found my place yet. That's okay. not normal for us, right? That's not normal. That's there's not usually right. silence. <laughs> yes. So this is really great. Now, please, everyone, listen to what Pope Pius IX teaches. Now, this teaching... Um, a lot of people will immediately jump to, well, is it infallible? Okay, it is authoritative. It is the teaching of the Roman pontiff to the entire church. You must, as a Catholic, you must assent to this. You must receive it and say, I agree. All right, let me quote this. Uh, so beginning here in paragraph 10, God himself has set up a living authority to establish and teach the true and legitimate meaning of his heavenly revelation. This authority judges infallibly all disputes which concern matters of faith and morals, lest the faithful be swirled around by every wind of doctrine 
which springs from the evilness of men in encompassing error. And this living infallible authority is active only in that church which was built by Christ the Lord upon Peter, the head of the entire church, leader and shepherd, whose faith he promised would never fail. This church has had an unbroken line of succession from Peter himself. These legitimate pontiffs are the heirs and defenders of the same teaching, rank, office, and power. And the church is where Peter is. And Peter speaks in the Roman pontiff, living at all times in his successors, and making judgment, providing the truth of the faith to those who seek it. The divine words, therefore, mean what this Roman see of the most blessed Peter holds and has held. For this mother and teacher of all the churches has always preserved entire and unharmed the faith entrusted to it by Christ the Lord. Furthermore, it has taught it to the faithful, showing all men truth and the path of salvation. Since all priesthood originates in this church, the entire substance of the Christian religion resides there also. The leadership of the apostolic see has always been active, and therefore, because of its preeminent authority, the whole church must agree with it. The faithful who live in every place constitute the whole church. Whoever does not gather with this church scatters. Okay, unquote. Wow. So that's Pope Pius IX. Now, can you really affirm what he just said? Can you really say that about Club Bergoglio in Rome? Right? Can you, the, the, the Vatican II church, the church over which Jorge Bergoglio presides, can you say that? Can you say these things of Jorge Bergoglio? And unless you're a, a diehard Novus Ordo, uh, like the Peter, the, the, the people at where Peter is, for example, uh, you know that there's no way you can say these things of Jorge Bergoglio. And uh, that is really the fundamental argument here. It's not about this or that opinion about automatic loss of office or who judges or or, you know, can we know uh, pertinacity and all of these things? These arguments may all have their place, but fundamentally, there is just no way you can recognize the Catholic teaching on the papacy verified in Francis. Okay, the same is true for other Novus Ordo popes, but let's just, let's just worry about Francis. Um, so... The, the, you, you would have to hold that either Francis is the Pope and the papacy is false, in which case he's not the Pope either, because then the papacy is just a human invention and means nothing. Or the papacy is true, and the problem is that Bergoglio isn't the Pope. And so there is no other conclusion, right? So we said of, we're said of a contest because we insist on holding fast to the correct understanding of the papacy. We will not give up our faith in order to be able to say we have a pope right and, 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 and sorry real quick and we won't give up our our respect and, and the the duty of obeying the pope in order to you know to to have this you know have your cake and eat it too like recognize and resist i, I think again that's part of it that we respect the pope and the papacy that's exactly why we say he can't you, you can't just say he's the pope but eh. Uh, cool, nice. You know, he's, he's, I don't care. Right, right. Um, exactly. So the, the bottom line is if Francis is the Pope, you must submit to him. Right. And submitting to him means that you assent to his teachings, you worship according to his liturgical directives, you accept his saints as to be venerated and imitated, and you allow yourself to be ruled by his government. That's what it means to submit to the Pope. And, and uh, so if, if you acknowledge Francis as Pope and you don't do that, that means you're refusing him submission. But refusal of submission to the Pope is schism. And denying his authority, like if you were to refuse him submission because you don't believe he has the authority, that's heresy. Okay? So people have to understand that if Francis is the Pope, then it doesn't matter what 
Peter Kwasniewski has to say, then you know it doesn't matter what uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider thinks. It also doesn't matter if Taylor Marshall has a good argument against something Francis taught in one of his official documents. Then none of these things are relevant, right? That's how the papacy works, but we've completely lost uh, a track of that. We've completely lost the, 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 the true Catholic position on the papacy because almost, you know, for, for decades, the, the predominant, um, how should I say, the, the most of the traditionalists have been recognized and resistors. And, you know, they didn't teach those things. They didn't emphasize those things. They, they, they quoted papal encyclicals, for example, Mortalium Animos, against ecumenism, but uh, didn't so much quote what it says about uh, the papacy. Uh, or if they did, at least they, it, you know, it didn't, it didn't uh, uh, occur to them like how that refutes their own position. So once you rediscover the papacy, you you realize very quickly there's no way Francis could hold it. Let's uh, continue. Unless you have anything else to add, there, I'd like to continue with uh, Bishop Schneider, okay. Kevin. Yep. We're okay. back. All right. Uh, perfect. So the heresy of conciliarism or Episcopalism says basically that there is a body within the church, ecumenical council, synod, college of cardinals, college of bishops, which can issue a legally binding judgment over the Pope. Okay. Uh, I have no objection there. That That is a heresy. And Bishop Schneider goes on, the theory of the automatic loss of the papacy due to heresy remains only an opinion, and even St. Robert Bellarmine noticed this and did not present it as a teaching of the magisterium itself. The perennial papal magisterium never taught such an opinion. That was Bishop Schneider. But as we've already said, it's not about automatic loss of office. It's not even about whether Francis is personally a heretic, that is, a non-Catholic. It's about the impossibility of affirming of Francis that which the Catholic faith affirms of the Pope, of the papacy. That is the ultimate point. Mm -hmm. Next, Schneider says, in 1917, when the Code of Canon Law, Codex Juris Canonici, came into force, the magisterium of the church eliminated from the new legislation the remark of the Decretum Graziani, the decree of Gratian, in the old Corpus Juris Canonici, meaning in the old collection of canon law, which stated that a pope who deviates from right doctrine can be deposed. Never in history did the magisterium of the church admit any canonical procedures of deposition of a heretical pope. The church has no power over the pope formally or judicially. I have no real objection uh, to anything there. Um, the The only uh, distinction I would draw is you have to understand, um, I, I don't know, at least not without looking up, what he is referring to in the decree of Gratian. Um, but as far as deposing a pope for heresy, the only thing that would be in um, harmony with orthodox doctrine is to say that there is a body who can declare that uh, the publicly heretical pope has lost his office. But the only way they could declare that, um, for example, the bishops gathered in ecumenical council without the pope, it would be a so-called imperfect council. Um, the only way they could do that, though, is because the publicly heretical pope has already ceased to be pope, and therefore they're not making a declaration over the pope, but over the former pope. Um, but that's really, we don't need to get into that now. Fundamentally, um, we're in agreement that the church has no power over the pope. Absolutely correct. Uh, next... Schneider says, the sure Catholic tradition says that in the case of a heretical pope, the members of the church can avoid him, resist him, refuse to obey him, all of which can be done without requiring a theory or opinion 
that says that a heretical pope automatically loses his office or can be deposed consequently. Therefore, we must follow the surer way, the via tutsior, and abstain from defending the mere opinion of theologians, even be they saints like St. Robert Bellarmine, which says that a heretical pope automatically loses his office or can be deposed by the church, therefore. Unquote. So we've this, he's just rehashing, uh, uh, you know, much of what he's already said. But for, first, let me say that he speaks of the sure Catholic tradition, but he provides no evidence of that. Um, that's unfortunate because he's making quite a claim. And, um, you know, even if there were theologians who um, investigated and disputed the question of a heretical pope centuries ago, um, you know, there has since been a First Vatican Council, and that First Vatican Council presented a lot of teaching on the papacy, and whatever may have been disputed 500 years ago uh, is not necessarily still acceptable today just because a theologian said it uh, centuries ago. You have to go by uh, the, the conciliar teaching and so it, it, I think it is not enough to just say, well, there's a Catholic tradition of, um, you know, th there being a heretical pope. Well, I know there isn't, <laughs> you know, at least, or if there was, it is certainly not acceptable anymore now after Vatican I. Um, what I'd like to ask Bishop Schneider is, if there's this sure Catholic tradition of having a heretical pope that one can resist and... Can he quote even one theological manual from before Vatican II, but after Vatican I, preferably, or at least after the um, at least after the 18th century? Uh, can he quote one theological manual that says that if the Pope teaches heresy, the faithful have the right and the obligation to reject it and thereby refuse submission to the Pope? I mean, if there's this sure Catholic tradition, then it shouldn't be that difficult for Athanasius Schneider uh, to find that. I don't think he can find even one, much less would he be able to find a magisterial document which said that. Could you imagine Pope Pius IX issuing an encyclical in which he says, <coughs> excuse me, in which he says something along the lines of, oh, by the way, you know, if if I, as your as the vicar of Christ, ever teach heresy, you know, it's going to be, it, then it's junk and you need to straighten me out. I mean, it, what an absurd thing to say. And if that were possible, what in the world do we need a Pope for? Right. Right. I, right? Then, then I mean, we can have YouTubers tell us, tell us what we shouldn't, shouldn't believe from the, from the magisterium. Right. I mean, we don't, we don't need why a Pope. In the yep. That's why they do have that in, in, in recognize and resist land. Right. Um, it, it makes it, it makes such a mockery of it all. And if the Pope can teach heresy to the whole church, well, how then, why then should we listen to an auxiliary from Kazakhstan? Right. And, you know, it, it, it places the burden of being Orthodox on each individual Catholic. That's insane. Right. And if most of all, it is contrary to the teaching on the papacy. And Kevin, maybe you could very briefly show the Novos Ordo Watch page that has so many uh, quotations from the Catholic Magisterium on the papacy, because this is where people, they don't have to do their own research. Of course, they're encouraged to, and they always can, and we got all the source documentation there. But um, I, I've collected so many excerpts from the various, go ahead and scroll if you sure. want, uh, so many excerpts from papal documents beginning with Pope Pelagius II, there is so much content that speaks about the church and the papacy um, that it, there is, if we want to talk about the sure Catholic tradition, well, there it is. And it doesn't say you can have a heretical pope, okay? Yeah, I'll definitely attach this, by the way, anyone anyone saying, hey, oh, Kevin, you're, you're going no. too fast. Don't worry, I, I will attach the link. And this time I'll, I'll really okay. do it, but it will be in the show notes um, if anyone wants, of course. To yeah, so we'll point. definitely have that. I think it's noblesordowatch.org slash the Catholic Papacy. 
uh, but you have to hyphenate it, okay? The hyphen Catholic hyphen papacy. And this is so, the, the Catholic teaching on the papacy is very beautiful because you can really see how wonderfully our Lord set up his church, how he guides it and guards it. And yes, of course, we're, you know, we, we are here in the Catholic Church after Pope Pius XII, and we're looking at the devastated vineyard, and we're wondering what in the world has happened here. Yes, uh, that that is, of course, uh, a disaster that we all have to make sense of. But the point is, we have to make sense of it in harmony with the Catholic teaching on the papacy and not contrary to it. We, you can't be a traditional Catholic and then say, well, all this traditional teaching is wrong. And uh, I mean, Peter Kwasniewski is, is uh, a really dangerous man because he has started to oppose the pre-Vatican II teaching on the papacy. And he's even called uh, something that Pope St. Pius X said, uh, an, an historical embarrassment. <laughs> That was Peter Kwasniewski. And we're not even talking about something St. Pius the Tenth said uh, to, uh, you know, his, uh, whatever, his cousin over a cup of tea. We're talking about something that's in the Acts of the Apostolic See. So it's official papal magisterium, and Kwasniewski is not just rejecting it, but uh, he's mocking it. Well, well and, and, and so. I mean, if you can do that, as you say, you can do that with anything. If you start doing it with Francis and and... JP two and Paul the sixth. Why not Pius the tenth? Why not Pius the fifth? Why not Saint Peter? I, I mean, I mean, seriously though. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you go down that road, where does well, it end? Never. Right, and and then the question becomes: Well, what's the point of having a Catholic right. church? Right. Uh, I mean, you know. So, and I understand that, of course. Then people will say, "Well, you say to Vacantis, uh, you know, if you can question one pope, you can uh, question all of them." But it, it that's not really. Like, that's not really what's happening. First of all, there have been false popes in the history of the church. It's not like as soon as you question someone reigning in Rome, then none of them can be, or, you know, uh, can be valid or, or, or something like that. Um, so we simply go back to, well, we look at, okay, well, when did this whole crisis, this whole mess really start? And I don't mean, um, you know, I mean, if you want to, if you want to just trace back uh, the history of sin, you're going to end up with Adam and Eve. Uh, that's not the question here. The question is, when was the last time, really, when you know, before all of this, 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 all, all these, these Novus Ordo doctrines and and all this, this big change, this new orientation, when did all of this come into being? And you find out it was during the pontificate, supposed pontificate of John the Twenty Third. Okay, that's not to say that there weren't already all kinds of seeds in some way. Uh, present in you know various bishops or or theologians before John the twenty third. Of course, it didn't come out of thin air, but you didn't have uh, the you didn't have a false magisterium being imposed until John the twenty third. So it makes sense to go back to that and say, well, um, these men cannot have been popes uh, because, and this is important because the Catholic teaching on the papacy is true, okay? So let me see if I can pick up where I left off. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so interestingly enough, Vatican I, the first Vatican Council in 1870, actually discussed the question of a heretical pope. Let's uh, recall that Vatican I, so it was called by Pope Pius IX, who also ratified it, in 1870, it was a very short council because they had to adjourn it very quickly because of the war against the Papal States, I believe. Um, and so the, it was going to be a longer council, but they had to uh, adjourn it. And it was never actually closed. So, well, John the Twenty-Third presumed to close it, but if he wasn't the true Pope, then the council is not closed. So technically, the council is still in session. But um, who knows, maybe a, a future true pope will simply not close it and just resume it. Wouldn't that be great? I would. I'm a, I'm, I'm a fan. <laughs> yes. Can you imagine the pope uh, resuming the council and saying, um, as I was saying, <laughs> <laughs> or as we were saying. Um, 
So uh, the First Vatican Council uh, is well known for the definition of papal infallibility, but of course the council also you know, taught a lot more than just that. Um, but the papacy, it just kind of laid out a lot, uh, the, you know, the origin, nature, purpose of the papacy, divine prerogatives for the papacy, and so on. And within the context of that, of course, the question came up, well, what if the pope becomes a heretic, right? And of course, also the question of Pope Honorius came up and was debated up and down. And you can read those things. Well, it's in Latin, but whoever can read Latin can read those things um, in the official acts of the council. They are actually available on the internet. I think the uh, historical collection is called Mansi, M-A-N-S-I. And um, I can even later provide a link. Maybe we'll put it in the show mm -hmm. notes um that has the texts of all these things so let me though quote from archbishop john purcell he was the archbishop of cincinnati at the time of vatican one and he attended the council and when he came back he shared some of uh what he witnessed at the council just you know the proceedings and so on let me find it can you pull that up um uh, Kevin, do you have it up on the screen, or can you put it up on the screen? That's the other um, link from Nova Soto Watch, right? That's right. So it says right here, and we'll have the um, link in the show notes, the question of a heretical pope considered by the First Vatican Council. Now, let's not misunderstand. We're not talking about the the council issuing a document on the question of a heretical of a heretical pope. No, we're talking about the bishops talking amongst each other and then the deputation of the faith, which was like, um, I think it was uh, like a commission set up, a commission of various bishops and cardinals um, to consider these questions. The commission then, uh, the deputation of the faith responded to the question that was submitted. And here is, well, actually, let me find it on my end. I'd like to quote what Archbishop Purcell related. And the, you can find this, and this is linked. We got all the sources here. Uh, the book is Life and Life Work of Pope Leo XIII. And it was written by Father James McGovern and uh, published in 1903. And this is on page 241. The question, this is a quote now, the question was also raised by a cardinal, what is to be done with the Pope if he becomes a heretic? Now listen closely. It was answered that there has never been such a case. The Council of Bishops could depose him for heresy, for from the moment he becomes a heretic, he is not the head or even a member of the church. The church would not be for a moment obliged to listen to him when he begins to teach a doctrine the church knows to be a false doctrine, and he would cease to be Pope being deposed by God himself. If the Pope, for instance, were to say that the belief in God is false, you would not be obliged to believe him. Or if he were to deny the rest of the creed, I believe in Christ, etc., the supposition is injurious to the Holy Father in the very idea, okay? The supposition that the Pope could be a heretic is injurious to the Holy Father in the very idea, but serves to show you the fullness with which the subject has been considered and the ample thought given to every possibility. If he denies any dogma of the church held by every true believer, he is no more Pope than either you or I. And so in this respect, the dogma of infallibility amounts to nothing as an article of temporal government or cover for heresy, unquote. So that was Archbishop John Purcell quoted in that book of Father McGovern, Life and Work of Pope Leo XIII. So, you know, there's a lot of pundits out there that was, oh, yeah, we've always had heretical popes, you know, nothing new. Nonsense. Nonsense. Uh, it was considered by the First Vatican Council. Not only was there never a heretical pope, it is impossible that there could have been one, and the council explains why he would immediately cease to be pope if he ever did become a heretic. Um, 
And, you know, the First Vatican Council actually speaks of the never failing faith of Peter in his successors also. And uh, that does not definitively rule out the possibility uh, of, a heretic, of, of a pope becoming a heretic in his private um, as a private person, but it makes it very unlikely. And I say that it's not definitive because you could argue that even the never failing faith of Peter is compatible with the idea that if the faith ever were to fail, he would no longer be Peter. Mm -hmm. Okay. At least I, you know, you can't really prove that that isn't possible. And so, you know, may, maybe it is possible. Well, I, I, I have um, to wonder Mario, if, and I, of course, this is all hypothetical, but I mean, if if Vatican I was allowed to continue and to finish, maybe these things would have been officially determined. You see how the devil, maybe that's how the devil worked. You know, maybe this war on the, on the Vatican states. I mean, that's maybe that was the moment where it had to be stopped. I, I obviously who knows, but it's it's something it's a it's something to ponder. That's that's a an amazing thing how the devil yes. worked things out. Yes, and. And actually, they had a draft ready of various canons. There was going to be a second uh, part to the Constitution on the Church. Um, the first part is the one with the Pope, and then the rest was going to be about the bishops and, I guess, the laity. And uh, they, they, they had a number of canons already drafted, um, and I've been wanting to publish those uh, sometime. But the thing is, you got to be careful with that because it's not magisterial, and yet it's not useless either. I mean, so these were not promulgated by the council. They were not approved by the Pope, but they certainly, uh, th these drafts do show the state of Catholic orthodoxy, of, of Orthodox Catholic theology at the time. Um, so, and in fact, you see them quoted sometimes in theology manuals. Interesting. So they do use them as data, but always with the caveat that it's not magisterial. Um, so, oh yeah, they were going to define no salvation outside the church. They were going to define, uh, I believe, matters on church and state. And um, also they were going to define, again, it, it didn't happen, so we can't say it's magisterial, but they, they, they had a canon ready on, uh, I forget exactly how it was phrased, but, you know, whoever, if anyone says that the, that the Church of Rome is not the, you know, the Catholic Church founded by Christ, let him be anathema, something along those lines. And I would have, you know, Vatican II could have never happened. Interesting. So, um, all right, let's see. So that was um, what Archbishop Purcell related, and it makes sense. It all makes perfect sense. You cannot have a pope who leads the whole church into heresy and then uh, oh well, the faithful—they need to know whom to listen to as an alter, as a backup, right? Like, oh, Pope has defected. Now let's go to the auxiliary in Kazakhstan. Or, uh, oops, nah, he doesn't make a whole lot of sense either. Let's go to the YouTuber from Texas, right? Or, or, or to someone like me, or someone like you. Like, right. it doesn't matter, right. right? We're, we're just. All I'm trying to do is show what the Catholic teaching is that's on the books. The idea is not to, um, you know, oh, the Holy See defects, and then you go to Novus Ordo watch. Well, no, well, no, the Holy See cannot defect. That's why we're saying that where the defection is obvious, these men cannot have been popes, right? A charlatan can certainly do whatever he wants, but a true pope uh, is protected by the divine promises. He is assisted. Uh, by God with uh, special graces and special privileges. So uh, getting back Athanasius Schneider, can you uh, pull that up again? Or uh, I want to make sure we don't lose our... Yep, now it's up. Okay, we don't lose that completely here. Um, all right. Great. So the Pope... Again, this is Athanasius Schneider speaking. Um, the Pope cannot commit heresy when he, spe when he speaks ex cathedra. This is a dogma of faith. In his teaching outside of ex cathedra statements, however, he can commit doctrinal ambiguities, errors, and even heresies. Uh, my reaction to that is, oh yeah? Prove it. Because that's quite uh, a thing to say. And I know some think that it that, that's obvious. Not only is it not obvious, it's not true. Um, because 
so let's just uh, keep in mind ex cathedra statements. Those are infallible definitions, right? When the Pope, with the fullness of his authority, like Pius the Twelfth did, defining the dogma of the Assumption, or Pius the Ninth with regard to the Immaculate Conception, um, those are infallible definitions. And a lot of people will reason erroneously that anything outside of such infallible definitions, uh, whatever the Pope says outside of the infallible definition could not only be false, but actually heretical. And that simply doesn't follow. Uh, even if something is not protected from all error, doesn't mean it's not protected from any error. Uh, and if the Pope could teach heresy to the whole church, just not infallibly, like, you know, as an infallible definition, uh, then that would mean that the papacy is dangerous outside of infallible definitions, like dogmatic ex cathedra definitions. Um, it would also put into doubt the church's entire credibility um, because infallible definitions are obviously rather rare. Uh, so if the Pope, so the Pope teaches, you know, throughout his pontificate, but rarely does a Pope even make even one infallible definition. So what you're saying is that most of the papal teaching is unsafe and, uh, you know, needs to be sifted by the faithful and whichever bishop considers himself more orthodox than the Pope. And I mean, that, that's simply insane. You would, an institution uh, like the Catholic Church could not, she would not be credible if outside of infallible statements, a Pope could lead the whole church into heresy. It's insane. I mean, does that does that not make sense? No, no, I'm I'm with you. It really is one of these things that kind of the the whole basis of the argument to me just doesn't seem to hold water because, as you say, I mean, if if that's the case, what's the point of the papacy? I mean, I, I, why not just be you know free Christians or whatever, where we can just you know kind of determine it on our own and look into things and base it on our own judgment and our own conscience or or whatever. I did. Mean, the Catholic Church is a monarchy, and it's based on a hierarchy. And, and so, if you just say, "Yeah, it could be wrong," then, as you say, then it it's gone. Where's the trust? The Pope would cease to be if the Pope could could teach heresy to the whole Church outside of an ex cathedra statement. Then the uh, the the Pope would cease to be the 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 principle of unity and the guardian of true doctrine and all that. In fact, it would mean that he himself can attack the faith almost always, except in those on those rare occasions, right? Or even if you want to say, well, uh, infallibility also applies, which of course is true, uh, infallibility also applies to the universal ordinary magisterium. Um, uh, in, you know, when the Pope teaches uh, with his ordinary authority to uh, the same doctrine, or rather when, when the bishops of the world teach the same doctrine as divinely revealed on faith and morals in union with the Pope, then that's also infallible. Okay, fine. Uh, but still, the Pope teaches practically every day and he ought to so um it is it would not be it would not make sense for christ to establish a church in which the pope can mislead the whole church require submission to the pope and then at the same time not be uh safe for a catholic to embrace right and not always infallible but he is always authoritative and the Pope is not always infallible, but his teaching is always infallibly safe to embrace. Else Christ could not um, uh, require you to submit to the Pope. The idea is that the church is your mother and you can uh, repose in her loving arms and feel entirely safe knowing that you cannot be misled. And, and the Pope is the, 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 the ultimate, like the, the uh, universal teacher of all Christians, of all Catholics. And so you destroy that with the idea that the Pope could be teaching heresy. Um, so, but then of course, you know, the, the, the semi-trads and Bishop Schneider, they're reduced, they're, they're basically forced to arguing that because they reject state of accountism. So they have no other choice basically, but to argue that. Well, and that was kind of my question earlier to you was, was, is it just cognitive dissonance? And, and again, not speaking for the normal person, but for, for someone like him, I mean, it kind of has to be just this, I, I, I cannot, 
I, I, nope, I'm just not going to understand it as I should. I mean, I mean, I think it's, it's hmm. almost willful ignorance. And again, I, I, I don't mean to judge him personally, as you said, we can't do that you know, for the interior, but, but you have to start to wonder with, with their arguments. It's kind of like, wait, do you really believe this? Like actually? Yeah. The problem is, I think that a lot of recognize and resist trans that, you know, because they live in their, I'll call it a bubble, um, you know, they, they read each other's articles, right? They, they, they live in their own recognize and resist world and they never step outside of it. And so they do not see, they do not realize how silly this is. You know, the, the, the Holy Father uh, issues uh, um, an apostolic exhortation, apostolic constitution, an encyclical, uh, whatever canon law makes a change to the catechism. And then some self-appointed journalists or website owners or bloggers or uh, YouTubers or podcasters come along and presume to determine for the rest of the church what in it is Catholic and what isn't, what is safe to embrace and what isn't. Um, Peter Kwasniewski, at this point, he's a, he's a philosophy professor, uh, I think a retired philosophy professor. Uh, at this point, he, he he's on record encouraging uh, clergy to disregard, to simply ignore their, what was it, suspension? Uh, basically, if they're, if they're being unfairly deposed, they should just ignore it. So, okay. so he's on record, uh, essentially asking Bishop Strickland, like, "Hey, if Francis deposes you, takes you, uh, says you're no longer the bishop, just ignore him and keep uh, uh, ruling as bishop uh, after all." That is like the textbook definition of schism, right? You know, um, this is really dangerous territory. Now, Francis isn't the pope, so it's not an actual reveal to. Uh, objectively speaking, it's not an actual refusal of submission to the Roman pontiff, but morally, subjectively, they believe him to be the Roman pontiff, so they are guilty of schism. And uh, Pius IX, it was Pope Pius IX, I believe in the encyclical Quartus Supra, in which he specifically says that even an unjust excommunication must be observed in the external forum. In other words, you cannot ignore it, even if it's not fair. Even if you were excommunicated out of malice or whatever, we got to remember excommunications are not infallible. It could be that you're excommunicated for something you're not guilty of. It's not supposed to happen, but it could. And uh, the Pope says, nope, you must still abide by whatever restrictions there are on you. And it actually makes sense because otherwise everyone would say, well, in my case, it's unjust. Right. Right. Sure. You can't have that. It's not how how it works in the church. So uh, let me see if we can go back here to Bishop Schneider. Okay, so he says Pope can teach heresy outside of ex cathedra statements. My my challenge is prove it, because because we can prove that it's not possible. Um, now he says this is Schneider again, and since the Pope is not identical with the entire church, the church is stronger than a singular erring or heretical pope. Um, I, I find it odd. First of all, that assumes that the church is somehow above the pope. Mm -hmm. At least that's how I'm reading it. Okay, he's saying that the church, can, basically the church can prevail against the pope. Um, it, it's absurd. And I can actually, let me see, I can quote here. Uh, give me one second. It's so, so much for a monarchy or a hierarchy, right? <laughs> well, just... here's the thing. So Father Felix Capello writes in one of his theological works, he wrote in 1912, he was a doctor of canon law. He, he taught at the Pontifical University in Rome. Uh, in other words, he knows what he's talking about. Uh, he writes... It is certain that the Roman pontiff is not subject to the College of Cardinals, nor to a council of bishops, as he himself is the bishop of bishops, the pastor of pastors, the head of all the particular churches and of the universal church itself. And, and Schneider would agree with that. Therefore, says Father Capello, the pope is simply and absolutely above the universal church. 
and above a general council, such that above himself he acknowledges nobody on earth as his superior, unquote. And I would say this is very much relevant here because it says the Pope is above the universal church. See, nowadays, uh, the semi-trads are kind of arguing, well, the Pope is just part of the universal church, and, and he's not an absolute monarch. And, and they try to diminish that um, because they need to somehow fit their heretical Pope into it all, but it can't be done. So I don't know what exactly, maybe Schneider can clarify what he means here, but he says the church is stronger than a singular erring or heretical pope, as, as if the church could prevail against the pope when the pope is above the church. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that what church is Athanasius Schneider talking about? Because it's not like, oh, there's this Orthodox Vatican II church, and then there's Francis alone, right? All out of line. Like, right. no, it's, I mean, the whole Vatican II church is a theological freak show, right? And again, that's completely disregarding, like we're, we're not trying to say who's guilty of what, and it's not about judging individuals. It's just objectively speaking, it is a nightmare. Um, and to make it seem now as if Francis were just the lone ranger who is, you know, who's lost it and the whole church is now going to correct him. It's, I mean, look at this. So the only, um, whenever, you know, it seems like every like few years, there's some kind of joint statement by a bunch of cardinals, arch, not even cardinals, just a bunch of, you know, conservatives and, semi-trads, you know, like VIPs, right? Uh, uh, professors and, and pre certain prelates and uh, some usually not that significant bishops, but even some, some diocesan bishops where they, rec where, where they condemn some heresy that Francis has uttered and, and they, um, whatever, where they dispute some, they oppose something, right? They correct something. And you you look at who signs these declarations, and you find out it's precious few people, right? Um, so, not only is the like the, the 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 church is stronger than a singular erring or heretical pope, they can't even get ten cardinals to condemn anything Francis has taught. At this point, they can at best get maybe two, right? And I'm thinking of the last, the two remaining Dubia cardinals. Burke and uh, Braunmüller, right? Because um, Meisner and Kafara, they died years ago, and they can't even get an audience with Francis. Right. But they at least try, right? They they looked at the Moore's Letizia and said, oh, <laughs> "I think we have a few questions here," right? Um, and they can't even get an audience. And so, but but nobody else has. Remember when Cardinal Burke said something about a fraternal correction that he was going to issue against Francis? Well, yeah. people have been waiting for that for years. I was going to say, was that seven, seven, eight years ago now? Yeah, I think it was twenty sixteen or twenty seventeen. Sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're still waiting. And it, look, the whole fraternal correction, whatever, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, he can, of course, he can, you know, uh, tell Francis whatever he wants, but. In the canonical sense, there's nothing he can do. The Pope is his superior. Right. He can't do anything. I mean, you know, he yeah, he can issue a a, a statement, uh, and the and and the Pope can simply ignore it, right? If, the, if Francis were the Pope, right? A true Pope can simply ignore like a, ooh, a warning, a correction, right, from an inferior. Scary thing. It means nothing coming from an inferior. Because it does not, the, the power to bind the conscience of the superior is not there. It's true that anyone, even an, in, an inferior, can admonish um, a, a superior with regard to sin. Because they're like, hey, look, you can't, you know, this is a sin. You can't do that. Yes, you can do that. But not, there can be no such thing as a canonical, you know, like um, the Holy Office would issue a canonical warning to a particular priest, uh, or for example, like, um, well, the, the Congregation for Bishops issued a canonical warning to Archbishop Lefebvre in 1988 saying, do not go ahead with the Episcopal consecration. Like that was actually, again, assuming for a minute that that was 
you know, uh, actually the true church hierarchy and all that, uh, th that was binding on his conscience. Like they had the power to issue that canonical warning. And isn't it ironic? The semi-trads, at least the, those that defended the SSPX, that it not binding, right? Mm -hmm. They just determined it was not binding. Funny how that works. But then when, you know, Cardinal Burke wants to issue something, then all of a sudden that would be binding on, on the Pope. Right. It, it honestly, like, this is what I mean. Like they never, the semi-trads are in their own bubble. They, they, they never really step outside of that and look at it and say, does this make sense? Uh, and that is the problem. And, you know, in my work here for Novus Ordo Watch, I have to read not just the semi-trads, but also the Novus Ordos. And um, so, especially Francis, of course, and, and uh, you know, other bishops that are perfectly in communion with him. And when you do that, you realize that the semi-trads don't seem to be aware of how little like you know how little how insignificant they are in the in the the grand scheme of the entire Vatican II church and i'm not trying to belittle them i'm really just trying to point out that yes i know yes they're growing for sure there are a lot of they they do have a good number of people that are very upset and and, and so on that's all true and yes they're they're their masses wherever they're still allowed they're full and they're growing yes granted that's all true but the Novus Ordo Church has what 1.1 billion people, right? Right. And when push comes to shove, you get maybe three. They get maybe three bishops to stand with them. And the only one who's actually an active diocesan ordinary is Joseph Strickland, and he will probably soon be retired, if you know right. what I mean. <laughs> okay. So that's the reality. So they can talk about how ha we're you know we're we're. Uh, we're, we're getting under Francis' skin and all that. At the end of the day, it, it, it is um, um, a, a, an incredibly small. I mean, you're, you're not even making a dent into anything. Although I, I mean, fine. Francis does, uh, you know, he does um, move against, you know, Strickland now and again. You know, he, he talks against the American conservatives uh, and so on, but. Um, you know, don't think that you're going to be able to, uh, I'm talking to the recognizing resistors now, don't think that that this is going to be able to derail his agenda. It is uh, maybe more like, it's a nuisance to him, perhaps, but it's not going to seriously do anything. And again, I'm not trying to belittle the efforts. I know they're trying, I'm, they're, they mean well, and they're trying to do good things, and they, they want to oppose, you know, globalism and, and all this this wicked agenda that Francis has going. Um, but even like with the synod now, right? The, up, the synod's coming up and the general suspicion is that they're going to use that synod to introduce all kinds of doctrinal changes. And they probably do want that. They, they do want to do that. The question is, will they be able to get away with it? Um, but even, even that um, resistance against the synod is fairly small all things considered. Um, and uh, you, you'll notice that, I think, when you look at what all the other, like the mainstream Novus Ordos are saying about the Senate. Um, I don't think they're, the, the semi-trads are going to be able to do much about the Senate. I mean, they can have, sure, they'll have their Rome Life Conference, which most people will not even report on. Um, and, you know, they might have a prayer meeting here or some kind of a protest there. And then there's going to be another book, maybe by Athanasius Schneider or maybe by Raymond Berg. And then this is going to be a foreword from whatever Father Ripperger. And then and then they're all, you know, they're going to get really excited. But at the end of the day, nothing is really going to happen. Because they can't. Because as long as they recognize Francis as the Pope, he wins. Well, I, I, see, I, <laughs> I think I think there is a monarchy. Exactly. Well, and I, I always kind of think of them as they they imagine that they're on the Titanic in 1912 and they can save the ship. What they don't realize is that they're on the Titanic in 2023. You know, it's, it is sunk. It's, it's, it's at the bottom of the ocean. It, it, there is no saving it. It, it is a, a, a disastrous, you know, relic, I suppose. It, 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 there's no chance of that. And I think that they, again, it's this cognitive dissonance. It's this I, almost lack of wanting to understand what the reality of the situation. And, 
And I think as we go through these arguments, I, th I think you just have to see that. That, and it's sad because because as you said, I, I think they seem to be well intentioned. Sure, but you can't. Yeah. I mean, you Most can't start. Them, you can't start making things up. You can't just start pretending the church to be something that it isn't, and the papacy to be something that it isn't, in order to fit you know, what you want. You can't, you can't have it that way. The church is what it is. The papacy is what it is. Yes. Let me, let me, um, let, let me use an analogy here. Um, recently I had to go and uh, get my glasses adjusted. I, I'm using contacts now, but sometimes I use glasses. Now it's not these glasses here. These are just computer glasses, but I'll, I'll make the point when, when you get glasses for the, for people who don't use glasses, they won't know that maybe, but um, what happens is they 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 may need adjustment, okay? They they might be kind of crooked. I mean, I'm exaggerating it now, but okay, they may not quite exactly fit your face, right? Now, there's two ways to fix that. You can either adjust the glasses themselves, right? You can use a little screwdriver, and then the the um, you can have that professionally done by by an optician or whatever they're called. Um, but there's also another option. You can have surgery done on your face to make sure the glasses fit, okay? Now, the semi-trads are the ones that are attempting the surgery on the face in order to make the glasses of Bergoglio fit and the face being the papacy. And we're saying, no, 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 no. You leave the face alone, please. Just adjust the glasses, okay? Bergoglio is not the Pope. That's that's the key to it all, and that's what solves it. Now, of course, the the the, the problem we're facing is actually a lot uh, more comprehensive than just Bergoglio. Um, but I'm saying, uh, let's just focus on one thing at a time. Uh, that is the the, re the the problem is not that uh, the papacy has been exaggerated or too many people are just too loyal to the Pope or or the, the whatever people think the Pope is always in none of these things are the problem. The problem is there is a false Pope in Rome. That is why he can do all of these things. And as long as people recognize him as the Pope. They're only contributing to the problem, because the one thing Francis real is is actually concerned about, not so much right now because there's not enough in terms of numbers, but if people, if, imagine if a large portion of people were to say he is not a valid pope, that would actually be a real problem for him. Not right now, not with whatever a million people. That's not enough, but. All of his perceived and, and de facto authority rests in him being the head of the Catholic Church. You take that away from him, and all that's left is Jorge Bergoglio, the apostate from Buenos Aires. That's all he is, you know. But uh, so all of his strength resides in him be in, in his being recognized as the Pope. Uh, we weren't done yet with Bishop Schneider, so unless you want to add something here real quick. Go for it. Maybe we can just go back. Um, okay, so Bishop Schneider says, okay, so the church is stronger than the singular erring or heretical pope. In such a case, one should respectfully correct him, avoiding purely human anger and disrespectful language. Resist him as one would resist a bad father of a family. Yet the members of a family cannot declare their evil father deposed from the fatherhood. They can correct him, refuse to obey him, separate themselves from him, but they cannot declare him deposed, unquote. Um, okay, this is simply the old bad dad argument, okay? And a lot of people like to use it, a lot of semi-trads, because uh, first of all, it seems to work, right? And uh, because it requires no theology, you can just talk about how your a bad father is still your father. Well, for one thing, a bad father is still your father because fatherhood it has its roots in biology. Okay, um, who is your father is uh, something that is dependent on an event in the past, and that's that. That's an unchangeable uh, reality. That is not. Um, a legitimate analogy for the papacy. Okay, uh, that is. Uh, I can't explain it now from the 
moral theology of it uh, with regard to what kind of power a father has over his children uh, versus the kind of power a pope has over the church, but it's no need. The uh, You can use analogies in order to illustrate church teaching, but you cannot use analogies to replace church teaching, and that is what happens a lot of times, right? Um, so essentially the, the relationship between church, uh, Pope and church, um, or, or Pope and yeah, his inferiors is not analogous to the relationship between father and children, at least not strictly speaking, in such a way that you could make this argument. Let me quote Father Chicada, uh, God rest his soul, Father Anthony Chicada, because he actually addressed this back in 2019 in an article entitled The Errors of Athanasius Schneider. And I don't know, Kevin, do you do you want to, uh, if you want to pull it up, you can um, check the link that I just sent you. Sure. Yep. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. And he, he refuted this particular uh, argument very succinctly. I want to okay, wait for you to put it up. Okay, yep. great. Got if it. you scroll down, scroll down to number two, Bishop Schneider's ancillary arguments. And then, yep, yeah, and then here, number six. I'm going to quote from this. <clears throat> The Pope is like a bad dad. You cannot disinherit him as the father of a family. Father Chicada says, quote, stupid and inapposite analogy. <laughs> the authority of the father of a family arises out of the natural law as the result of a physical fact and consists in private dominative power over his subjects, wife and children. He can never cease to be a father. The authority of the Roman pontiff, on the contrary, is based on a divine power conferred upon him as the result of a juridical fact and consists in public jurisdictional power over his subjects, the members of the church. He was not always the Pope, and he can cease to be Pope through heresy, insanity, resignation, or death. The idiotic bad dad analogy is one of the most ancient of the many recognize and resist tribal myths. See my video, Why Do Traditionalists Fear State of Accountism? And my article, the tribal myth keepers, unquote. Great. So uh, uh, with that, uh, we can, I think we've answered Bishop Schneider on that part, on that point. Um, and then the last paragraph of Schneider's declaration there regarding the validity of Francis Schneider says, good Catholics know the truth and must proclaim it, offer reparation for the errors of an erring pope. Since the case of a heretical pope is humanly irresolvable, we must implore with supernatural faith a divine intervention, because that singular erring pope is not eternal, but temporal, and the church is not in our hands, but in the almighty hands of God. We must have enough supernatural faith, trust, humility, and the spirit of the cross in order to endure such an extraordinary trial. In such relatively short situations, in comparison to 2,000 years, we must not yield to a too human reaction and to an easy solution, declaring the invalidity of his pontificate, but must keep sobriety, keep a cool head, and at the same time, a true supernatural view and trust in divine intervention and the indestructibility of the church." Unquote. Um, you know, I, I would say no, nothing would destroy the church more than a heretical pope. Um, but um, I mean, a lot of the things he, His Excellency or Bishop Schneider says here, is um, are not wrong. I mean, good Catholics know the truth and must proclaim it, offer reparation, just in general for all you know all sorts of things. That's fine. But the errors of an erring pope like that. There is no such thing, okay? And Schneider has certainly not proved that there is. Uh, the case of a heretical pope is humanly irresolvable, he says. 
I uh, could agree with that. Uh, Father Capello agrees with it. Uh, um, for which reason, by the way, he, which is one reason why he says that such a case is impossible, because it could not be solved. Um, let me, go, maybe we can look at that post in a minute, just to introduce people to it. Um, I, I can't remember if I sent you the link uh, already or not. If not, I'm just going Which to- Which one was that? Now. So this is a Nobles Auto Watch post from April 29th, 2022. Distinguished pre-Vatican II theologian, a heretical pope is impossible. And uh, so he explains from, based on the Catholic doctrine to be held, we have an exclusive translation of that up. That's why uh, I, I put this up. This is not something you're going to find in English anywhere else because the, the original, of course, is in Latin. He explains why, in his judgment, a heretical pope is impossible. And he says at the very end, in light of all this, with good reason, we conclude that the opinion that affirms that the Roman pontiff cannot become a heretic, even as a private doctor, remember that again, there's that caveat, certainly not in his magisterium, but even as a private doctor, that it's, that it's impossible for the Pope to become a heretic in private is most probable, indeed, according to our judgment, is entirely certain. So, that's prescinding from the question of what would happen if the Pope were to become a heretic in his private capacity. He's just saying that it is not possible in his judgment, it's not possible that it should even happen. Now, St. Robert Bellarmine also said that he believed it was not possible for a Pope to become a heretic. But he said, since he cannot prove that it is not possible, therefore, he will consider what would happen if it were possible. And that's what the um, the dispute was about uh, with the other theologians. What happens if a pope does become a heretic if we assume that it is possible? So Bellarmine said, I don't think it's possible, but can't prove it. So here's what would happen if it is possible. Um, so personally, I could certainly agree with Bishop Schneider that the heretical pope is humanly irresolvable uh, on the other hand, uh, that's why I personally believe it's not possible for a pope to become a heretic. But we've already seen, and this is not a matter of opinion of or of any theologian's view or whatever, but based on Catholic teaching, it is not possible that the pope teach heresy in his official magisterium. Because like we saw earlier, and if you, if you look at all the Catholic teaching on the papacy, you cannot reconcile that with that teaching of the Pope as the um, unshakable guard and guardian of the true faith, um, it's, it's simply not possible. Bishop Schneider says, we must have enough supernatural faith, trust, humility, and the spirit of the cross to endure such an extraordinary trial. Okay, fine. Uh, but that's also true if you're a state of a contest, okay? Uh, if, if you don't don't think for a minute that say the Vacantas are just trying to you know, oh we, we just don't want to put up with a trial we're just we're too chicken we can't take the cross um, say the Vacantism will definitely um, uh, require you to suffer okay in some way or another uh, so it, it's also so Bishop Schneider who calls say the Vacantism an easy solution and a human reaction. It's neither. Well, it might be easy. In the, it's, it's actually not even a solution. It is simply a diagnosis, right? Sure, it solves the problem of what do we do with Francis's heresies? That, that's, that's true. Um, but it's not wrong because of that, just because that part is easy. Um, we're, and, and hopefully I've you know, been able to show that in this, in this uh, episode, we're not a set of a contest because it's, because it's easy or because we want it to be easy or because we're looking for easy human rights. We're set of a contest because that is what the Catholic teaching on the papacy requires us to be. 
So that's not a human reaction. If anything, that's a that's a divine reaction, so to speak. It's it's a reaction uh, based on divine doctrine, and uh, that is also keeping a cool head. It is, in fact, I would throw it. Uh, uh, I would turn it around to Bishop Schneider and say, "No, uh, sir, yours is a human reaction, because you just you just." act the way you would uh, with regard to any other leader in any other organization. You simply resist and reject and say, nope, I won't. Uh, this is wrong. You got it wrong. We're the, we, we've got it right and you're wrong. We're the orthodox ones. And even though you're the principle of unity and the guardian of orthodoxy, you got it wrong. We'll resist you. That is a human reaction. And it's certainly not one found in the teaching of the church. And so we're the ones keeping a supernatural view and we're the ones trusting in divine intervention and in the indestructibility of the church. I'm more than uh, happy to say that there are many, uh, there are some issues and questions in state of Vakantism that are difficult to resolve and that state of Vakantists are not in agreement on with each other. Um, state of Vakantism is definitely not the easy solution that, right, makes everything so much simpler and everything's solved and everything's uh, cookie cutter, you know, it, it's not that way at all. But, um, you know, you simply have to, if you believe in God, you believe in the Catholic church, you believe in the Catholic faith. There are some things, if you, if you don't have an answer, you, may, you must simply leave it up in the air and say, uh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, right? Or um, Lord, enlighten me. And, uh, you know, we trust in you. We, we believe in you, we believe in your words that the church will not fail, that um, the gates of hell will not prevail, that the Pope is the rock and that we will have a Pope again. Oh, we may not be able, we may not know exactly how. There are some theories, some better founded than others, right? Uh, but um, mystery is not incompatible with the promises of Christ or with faith contradiction is. So the bottom line is, if Francis is the Pope, then everything the church teaches concerning the Pope applies to him, applies to Francis. Because the person of the Pope, like who the Pope is, the individual, and the teaching on the papacy, you know, what the papacy is, those are two sides of the same coin. You cannot split them apart. You cannot say, I will now have the Pope, but not all of these things or, or none of these things or some of these things do not apply to him because uh, then I can't make it work. That's not, it's not something we can do. Um, and uh, with that, I think we've got uh, everything covered with regard to Bishop Schneider. I would like to say just a few things about uh, a video Kennedy Hall put out, uh, I believe it was yesterday, September 19th, maybe it was the day before, where Kennedy Hall addresses also Bishop Schneider's uh, statement regarding the validity of Francis. And there are just two short things that he says that I'd like to point out and I'd like to comment on because I think they definitely need comment. Do you have that uh, available, Kevin? Yep. In just a sec. All right, I'll play the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll play the first clip now. That is fascinating. As far as I can tell from my- Okay, let's listen to Kennedy Hall. There are some opinions that in theory, members of the church could depose a pope in the same way members of the church vote in and elevate a pope. Meaning uh, the church herself has the authority to bring the pope in, therefore the church herself has the authority to bring the pope out. That's an opinion that's been held. So for Bishop Schneider okay, to say that there's there. no possible. Thanks. That opinion Kennedy Hall just mentioned is absolutely not acceptable. It It, it is possible that, it, uh, that the church tolerated it at some point, perhaps many hundreds of years ago, but definitively with Vatican I, that opinion cannot be held because it's heretical. Um, the, 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 what may seem at first like a, a reasonable thing to say, like, oh, well, look, hey, the cardinals, you know, gave the pope the papacy. Why can't they take it away from him? 
The reason that is not possible is that the cardinals do not give the papacy to the pope. The papacy is not a power they collectively own and then bestow upon one single man. They merely decide on who the individual will be who is to receive the power of the papacy from Christ the Lord. The papacy comes from Christ. No one else can bestow it upon anyone. So the role of the cardinals... Uh, is to designate the individual who is to become Pope, but they do not give him the power. They just point, they just identify the individual who is to receive the power. And it is Christ that bestows the papacy. That is why no one, uh, no, no inferior of the Pope, no human being can take a valid pontificate away from uh, a reigning Pope. So that is, I, I absolutely thought that needed to be clarified. Um, so, and it may have been, like I said, a tolerated opinion at some point in the past, but certainly is not now. Interesting. Because otherwise you're saying that the Cardinals are superior to the Pope. Right. That, that they somehow that own the papacy or whatever. It's, it's, it's a completely absurd uh, thesis. Um, okay. The next one, I think... Um, Kevin, if you could uh, go to the 1109 timestamp, and we'll listen until 1139, where Kennedy Hall says something that I, I cannot figure out for the life of me what he is saying, or, or what he means. Yeah. And he doesn't elaborate, unfortunately. Give me a sec. I expected YouTube would give me a problem, but I got it ah, figured out. Of course. <laughs> All right. well, if anything, I do have the quote here. No, I got it. I got it. Uh, coming up. You got it? Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. Give me just a sec. Uh, make sure I got the right one. All right, here we go. That must be in place before the Pope speaks ex cathedra for him to be able to do that at all. Um it's not like a magical power where, you know, if he wants to speak from the chair, his mouth is shut by some mysterious power or something. For something to be an ex cathedra statement, there must be evidence that he is appealing to what is sound dogma to begin with. So that, it's actually quite easy to understand why that's not possible. Okay, you can, you can stop there. Does anyone have the faintest idea what Kennedy Hall is talking about? Let me just quote it again. For something to be an ex cathedra statement, like an infallible definition, there must be evidence that the Pope is appealing to what is sound dogma to begin with. I have no idea where he got that from. And uh, he doesn't say, so uh, I, I don't know. I just thought that was, I'm sorry, I thought it was nuts. Um, it, he's placing but, but an I mean addition. You know, on sorry, the... it, it just blows my mind. But here's one of the issues with listening to armchair theologians, right? I mean, maybe when they, if you rant for 15 minutes, maybe you're going to say something that that sounds fine when you watch it through, but then when you actually pay attention to it, it's like, wait a second. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I don't know where he read that or or what it is, and I I'm, I can't really interact with it if I. I mean, there's nothing there to refute because he didn't prove what he was saying so i'm just gonna stop there but i mean i'd like to um say something about um the sometimes you will hear people say well it says right there in vatican one that the holy spirit was not promised to uh, peter and his successors so that he can come up with new doctrine right but that he would faithfully guard uh revelation and uh, set it forth uh, maybe we can even now, I don't have it ready now, but, you know, we all know the, the quote. And uh, actually, let me, let me find it in Denzinger uh, uh, real quick. And it's from the uh, from Vatican I's uh, dogmatic constitution, uh, Pastor Eternus, chapter 4. Uh, it is Denzinger 1836. So let me quote it from there. For the Holy Spirit was not promised to the successors of Peter that by his revelation they might disclose new doctrine, but that by his help they might guard sacredly the revelation transmitted through the apostles and the deposit of faith and might faithfully set it forth. 
Okay. Now, uh, it has become very common for the recognize and resist traditionalists to use that as placing a restriction um, to be applied afterwards, uh, placing restriction on the Pope that you can apply after the fact to his teachings. In other words, the Pope can teach whatever he wants, and then uh, the laity or some bishop or uh, whatever, uh, they come with a big sifter and they look, okay, well, which of this, is there anything here that is actually new revelation or, or just, you know, so just some wacko teaching that we can sift out because after all, the Holy Ghost wasn't given to the Pope to teach us nonsense. But that's not what Vatican I is saying. Vatican I is uh, pacifying troubled consciences who think that if we say that the Pope can make infallible declarations on his own without the consent of the church, uh, then uh, how do we know he's not going to just teach whatever? You know, what, well, what if he decides to say there are uh, whatever, that the Virgin Mary is God or some blasphemy uh, like that? And so Vatican I says, don't worry. The Holy Ghost is with the Pope, and the Holy Ghost didn't bestow, or uh, the Holy Ghost wasn't given to the Pope so that he can just come up with his own teachings, but rather that he would be helped to, to always be orthodox. That's what this is saying. It is not, um, it is not a normative precept for the Pope to follow, as in, don't you dare teach something uh, that's contrary to Revelation, as if he could. Rather, it is describing that the Pope will never teach anything that is out of harmony with the gospel, that he will never come up with a new doctrine. And uh, that is actually evident from the context. The, 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 the teaching doesn't really make any sense if you believe it means the Pope can teach whatever he wants, and then whatever is junk, uh, the faithful have to sort out and just you know go through the encyclical, like cross this out, cross that out. And then I guess, I don't know, in the end you compare notes and see you know, do we are we all in agreement that this needs to go? And I mean, it's 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 an insane position, but I understand that people who are uh, spend a lot of time in those recognize and resist circles, say people who are with the SSPX, for example, and they're always surrounded by like-minded individuals. I understand that they cannot; it's it's hard for them to see how laughable or how unreasonable the position is. And I know because I used to be uh, with the SSPX, or I, I used to attend an SSPX church, and I used to buy into their position about 20 years ago. And that uh, is, so I rem so I sympathize uh, with. I'm not trying, uh, you know, I'm not trying to slam anyone. I'm just saying I understand that you cannot quite. Um, I understand why not everybody sees sees that. So it's a good idea to just sometimes just step out of it. And ask yourself, for somebody looking in from the outside, does this make, is this convincing? Is this, 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 this make sense? And I know probably some people can say, well, you said if a are so funny, uh, do you realize how silly it is uh, to say that Francis is not the Pope when everybody knows he's the Pope? Um, but that's, first of all, it, it might look silly to an unbeliever, but to somebody who believes in the papacy, it is not silly at all. Um, and we really don't care uh, what the world thinks about it. Um, you know, Bill Clinton can believe Francis is Pope. I, I <laughs> has no bearing on me whatsoever, you know, and should have no bearing on the Catholic. Um, so that would be the human way of looking at it, the, not, the, not the supernatural divine way of, of looking at it, the, 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 you know, you want to be able to look at everything through the eyes of faith, right? And not with a merely human uh, 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 rationality or uh, with a merely human um, set of eyes that says, well, everybody says he's the Pope, so he's got to be the Pope. That's not how it works in the church. And perhaps I should make one final um, uh, point that uh, I think I put this in my blog post yesterday. I can't even remember now. Um, you know, for people who are still kind of uncomfortable with this, look, if let, let's, um, let's say for a minute that Francis were a validly ordained priest and bishop. Okay. 
We don't believe he is either, but let's say he is. If Francis were to consecrate rice instead of bread, and it were, other than that, everything else were like traditional Latin mass, high mass, candles, incense, everything. You would know that that is not a valid mass. You would know that. Even if everybody else were telling you, what are you talking about? That was valid. No, you'd know it's not valid because rice is not valid matter for the Holy Eucharist. Okay, It's impossible to consecrate rice. Um, and with that knowledge that that was invalid, you uh, you would be a, like you would have certainty regarding that. You would have genuine knowledge, and you could act on that knowledge. Um, and that's similar to how we know Francis is not the Pope. Okay, it's that that same kind of certainty. Um, it cannot be wrong, as long as Catholic teaching is true, and Catholic teaching is true. Okay, and of course I'm talking about pre-Vatican II teaching. Um, so, I don't know, Kevin, I think we've been on now for about two hours. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I, I, I always know that um, it, it, everything will get covered very well. And, 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 but that's, that's, why, that's why we love having you on, Mario, and because, <laughs> because the, the, I mean, not just because, because it goes on for two hours, but because, you know, it, you cover things from, from the actual source. And that is, of course, the church. And I think that sometimes it takes a little bit longer than just, you know, oh, for sure. winging it, you know, you know, getting behind a microphone yes. and winging it a bit. And then that's, that's, it is really dangerous. And I think it's good that you bring, bring the support behind you. And that's, what's really talking, not, not, not the two of us. Yes. Yes. You know, I had to chuckle when father Altman, you know, came out with his Bergoglio is not the point. He had already said that by the way, back in July, I think it was at the canceled priests conference. Was it June right. or something? And it was already a big issue then. And then he he kind of doubles down and, and, and everybody is acting as if this were the first time he was saying it. Um, but the funny thing was how there was quick reaction by the uh, usual suspects. You know, yeah, Timothy Flanders, come on, on 1 Peter 5 right away for why Father Altman is wrong, you know. And uh, if, if Altman had simply said Francis is anti-Catholic, uh, whatever, forerunner of the Antichrist, I'm not sure it would have triggered the same kind of reaction. It's so true. It, it, it's so funny. Like the one thing you can't say about the guy is that he's not the Pope. When that is the one thing like that we can say with utter certainty. Right. So. You see, you see how the devil works. You know, he, he makes it so that that's the one thing he does not want to be told is the truth, of course. Well, Mario Dirksen is here telling us as much truth as he possibly can. And, and we hope to have him on again sometime in the near future. We know for sure as we always say that there will be news there will be something to talk about because well That's this for is sure. this is the Bergoglian age in um well yeah yes. that, that that'll continue to to give things to for, for for Mario to spend his time on and thankfully to come on with us as well please again like share subscribe comment all of those things on on wherever you're watching it on on Mario's channel or on ours and and share it share it with your friends and family really because i know it's long i know Maybe not a lot of people are getting to the end of this, at least in one chunk, but but there's so much information here that you don't know the one bit of material that someone's going to see or hear that's going to really mm -hmm. spark that and say, wow, that's a good point. You know, th that's true. I mean, he can't be the Pope. And, and you know, I think that that shows you how important this is. And, and, and again, share it. Mario, thank you so much, as always. And I, I look forward to having you on again sometime in the near future. Thank you as well. Let me just say, I do have a podcast, tradcast.org, tradcast, as in traditional podcast, traditional Catholic podcast, tradcast.org. There's uh, longer episodes, the, the uh, um, full length episodes are uh, about three or four a year only, but they're, they're really intense. And then uh, a more frequent Tradcast Express uh, that is not quite so detailed and intense, but more frequent. So people who are interested in that, tradcast.org. Mario is just trying to steal, trying to steal from my my podcast viewership. You know, we're, we're oh, we're, I'm sorry, we're, 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 we're big time. <laughs> we're, we're, we're big time competitors over here. You know, no, absolutely, it's it's awesome stuff. And and, and go, of course, NovaSortaWatch.org as well. Um, Mario has always got all sorts of stuff. Yeah, you can find you on Twitter, I, Facebook. I don't oh, yeah. think anymore, but Twitter as well. Watch and at Tradcast now. Awesome, perfect, Mario. Until next time, God bless you.
God bless. Take care.